भगवती वासुदेव ओम नमो भगवती वासुदेव हरे कृष्ण हरे डोटी सो गुड टू सीक द ब्लेसिंग्स ऑफ राधा माधव राधा श्याम सुंदर कृष्ण बलराम बाल गोपाल गोनी था श्री प्रभुपाद गुरुमाज दी असेंबली डोटीज और इट कंटिन्यू विद द सनातन धर्म कोर्स दैट वी आर डूइंग एंड वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट स्क्रिप्चर्स दैट we should try to read um understand study is the bhagavad gita because the bhagavad gita contains a summary of all of the vedic philosophy all of sanatan dharma so if we can get a good understanding of bhagavad gita then we will have a excellent understanding of sanatan dharma the philosophy of vedic dharma and bhagavad gita is spoke has been spoken or sung gita means song bhagavad means god song of god S- sung by krish to arjun just before the battle of kurukshetra when the battle was about to start krishna who was the chariot driver of arjun was asked by arjun to please take the chariot in the middle of the battle he wanted to see who was on the other side because a family had gathered and there was going to be a humongous battle in kurukshetra and the family is of the kuru and, and pandavas they had the same grandfather um who was vedvyas but vedvyas had um tatarastra pandu as children and vidur as well but the children of tatarastra and pandu didn't see eye to eye they were cousins first cousins and they they had a difference of opinion in respect of the um kingdom of kastapur and so many atrocities had been committed on the pandavas by the um tatarastra's sons that there had been no choice but to have a battle to fight it out so on one side was the pandavas the five brothers on the other side there was a hundred brothers of um uh, as hundred cousin brothers the sons of dhritarashtra and on each side there were great warriors who had aligned themselves with one or the other side and arjun wanted to see who is on the other side who i'm going to fight so krishna took the chariot into the middle of the battlefield and this is one of the attributes of the lord he placed the chariot right in front of arjun's greatest challenge and the greatest challenge arjun faced was his grandfather for two reasons one his grandfather was the greatest fighter the greatest kshatriya the strongest of them all because he had been granted a boon that he could choose the timing of his own death and secondly and much more important was that this was his beloved grandfather he loved his grandfather bishma pitama he loved him so krishna took the chariot right in front of bishma and arjun when he saw bishma his grandfather he immediately started to waver in his commitment to the battle and um that's where the bhagavad gita starts in chapter 1 krishna makes arjun confront his demons and arjun feels weakness of heart weakness of heart because of his affection especially to his grandfather and he submitted to the lord 
that he would not fight, giving many reasons such as compassion, lack of enjoyment because killing was involved, the incurring of sin by the fighting and the destruction of the family and its traditions. So Arjun gave many different reasons why he was no longer willing to fight in this battle. And at that time, in chapter 1, Krishna didn't say a word. Oh, I said a few words. <laughs> Not many words. And the reason why Krishna remained silent was because Arjun thought he knew all the answers and he didn't request Krishna's opinion didn't uh, take shelter of Krishna. So Krishna remained silent. So this is a, something that we also have to learn, to listen to the Lord. We have our plans. We feel that they are the best plans in order that we um, can live our lives in a way that we want to live our lives. And hence, we may not listen to anybody, including the Lord. And therefore, the Lord, he will not communicate with us because we've already made our plans. Okay, fair enough. So, carry on. Do what you want to do. But if we really want guidance, if we really want to help ourselves, then... We would take shelter of the Lord. And this is where in chapter 2, Arjun realized that the problem was much bigger than he could handle. And as a consequence of that, he surrenders to Krishna. He surrenders to Krishna. He knows this is, this battle is unavoidable. If I walk away now, I will be seen as a coward. And for a Kshatriya to be seen as a coward is the greatest insult that one can bear. He knew he couldn't back out of it. And at the same time, he had this strong conviction that he should not fight. So he was in turmoil. He was having an internal battle which he could not um, solve. He could not solve that problem. So he took shelter of the Lord. Brilliant thing to do. And we also, you know, will face these challenges. And uh, if, if we take shelter of the Lord, then there's a chance that we may be able to hear the Lord. So the Lord immediately, the Lord is very kind to his devotees, especially devotees like Arjun, who the Lord has great affection for. He has great affection for everyone. And he will reciprocate our affection for him. So the greater our affection for him, the greater his affection for us. It said that if we take one step towards the Lord, he'll take many steps towards us. So, but that step has to be taken because Krishna has given us free will. That free will means we have a choice. If we want to walk away from the Lord, he will not stop us. If we want to go towards the Lord, he will encourage us. So, as soon as Arjun took shelter, he immediately Krishna takes him to the spiritual platform by explaining the difference between the body and the soul. Immediately. Krishna is explaining to Arjun that don't you know all the kings who are standing before you, you and me, we've always been and will always continue to be. There will never be a time when we did not exist, nor will we, nor will we not exist in the future. We will continue to exist. Don't you know, Arjun, that this body, it goes through boyhood, um, childhood, boyhood, adulthood and old age. And eventually, 
um, the body will die, but the soul journeys through all the different bodies. And after death, it continues to journey in another body. In this way, um, Arjun was explained by Krishna that the soul is eternal. It never dies. It cannot be burnt. It cannot be cut into pieces. It cannot be drowned. Um, it is everlasting. It is uh, never um, subject to birth and death. But the body uh, will. It's temporary. The body will be subject to death. The body is already dead because it's just made out of material elements. The soul gives it life or apparently gives it life. So the first, that I think it is about 18 verses, Krishna explains about the soul. And this is the first instruction of the Bhagavad Gita and the most important instruction. Because if we can understand that we are not the body, but we are spirit soul, then our activities will be based on the soul, not just on the body. Of course, we are living in the body. And therefore, we have to take that into account in our day-to-day -day activities. But if we also understand that we are beyond the body, we are spirit soul, then our behavior, our activities, will align with the that situation that we understand that we are eternal beings, that we are subjected to birth and death and old age and disease, birth after birth after birth. And we've been in this material world for uh, time since time immemorial. And we have to seek um, a solution to this everlasting issue that we are facing of um, birth, death, old age and disease. So this is considered to be one of the most important instructions and Krishna gives it to him immediately, straight away. So this is the um, benediction of having a spiritual guide who is um, bona fide. And of course, the Supreme Lord is bona fide. He's a perfect uh, teacher. So Arjun asks the questions from the perfect teacher who gave him perfect answers. Second thing that Arjun is explained by Krishna in this same cha cha chapter 2, and chapter 2 is like the summary of the whole Gita. It has many verses, I think 70 two verses. It's a very long chapter. But it's, 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 a, it's a great chapter. Because the next um, explanation given by Krishna to Arjun is that although you are separate from the body, you are the soul, you're living in the body, and therefore you have a, a duty to perform from the body point of view, the worldly point of view, and you have a duty to perform from the spiritual, the soul point of view. You can't escape from both. You've got to do both. What is your worldly duty? You're a Kshatriya, you're a warrior. You have to uphold the law. And on the other side, we have... The parties have broken every single law. So you have to fight this battle. It is your duty. If you walk away, um, then you will be seen as a coward and you will have failed in your duty. But also, you have a duty that you are a spirit soul. And from that emerges a series of uh, activities that you have to conduct to become perfect. And Krishna then explains, because Arjun asks him, how does that person walk? How does he talk? He's a perfect person who's perfect. 
So then Krishna describes that person. Again, it's a description of about, I think he answers that question in about 18 verses. And it's um, one of the longest answers Krishna gives. How he sits, he controls his senses. How he walks, he engages his senses in the service of the Lord. How he talks, how he deals with provocative situations. So Krishna gives lots and lots of wonderful instructions. If one thing, for example, he explains that if the senses come and attack you because they want to eat something, see something, touch something, hear something, smell something, and those things are not desirable, then the self-realized soul, he will become like a, like a tortoise. He'll withdraw his senses within himself and not get fooled, not get... Um, Diverted, his attention will not be diverted from the real mission. So many instructions are given. Chapter two is um, truly one of the most fascinating chapters that one can read uh, uh, in order to gain an insight into who one is, what we should be doing, and how we should be doing it. So these are this chapter really does give. A fantastic guideline how to live in this world. All Bhagavad Gita is our roadmap to live in this world. But chapter two is the summary of the Bhagavad Gita and a very delightful, wonderful um, summary by Krishna. Okay, chapter three. Chapter three is all about Karma Yoga <clears throat> and it's entitled Karma Yoga. Krishna could have stopped at chapter 2 as he had he has given knowledge to Arjuna as to who he is and what he should do both from a material point of view and from a spiritual point of view but Arjun wanted the knowledge to turn into action so for our benefit he inquired from the Lord he inquired uh, Chapter 3 defines, so he has many questions. Arjun was encouraged by the Lord to inquire, and he did. He had lots and lots of questions. He def uh, chapter 3 defines a practice of karma yoga, the technique of achieving spiritual connection with God through our daily work. The themes of this chapter are as follows. So let's go through the different themes. By acting for the Supreme, by acting for the pleasure of the Supreme, without selfish motives, one can be liberated from the laws of karma, action and reaction, and attain transcendental knowledge of the self and the Supreme. At the moment, if we are engaged in many activities, but without the presence, without having the Lord in mind, then those activities will be the cause of our bondage. Whether they're good or bad activities, they will be the cause of our bondage. Bad activities, of course, will give us future issues, problems, because of the reactions that, that come from the karma. But even good activities, we will have to enjoy the fruits of the good activities and stay in this material world. But if we can put the Lord in the center of our activities and perform all of our activities for the pleasure of the Lord without having selfish motives, then those activities are not considered to give us a karmic reaction. Those activities are regarded to be our karma without any karma because they're in connection with the Supreme Lord. So... This is uh, what is encouraged that we perform these kind of activities, which are effectively activities of bhakti, uh, acts of devotion. And the acts of devotion can look like the acts of karma. They look like, they, they look like they're exactly the same. But one will... Keep us in this world, the other 
will take us away, it will take us back to the spiritual world. The activities will be the same, but our consciousness is different. So, um, and the best example to give is eating. We eat food, and ideally, we eat vegetarian food. No meat, no fish, no eggs, no onion, no garlic. No. So, if we're eating food, even if it's vegetarian food, that food will bind us to this world. But if that food is offered to the Lord and becomes pushad, then that food will liberate us. That food is no longer food. It's the mercy of the Lord. So that will actually take us out of this world. So same activity. We're eating. <laughs> but one, the first type of food we're eating will keep us in this world. The second will take us away from this world, into the spiritual world. So easy. So easy. Karma Kanda. So the second thing, Karma Kanda activities are distinguished from Karma Kanda, Karma Yoga. So Karma Kanda, what is that? Karma Kanda is basically those activities which are, it's like a business transaction. We worship some dev dev devatas, some demigods, in exchange for some fruits from those devatas. So it's um, these are these are selfish activities, but karma yoga is different. Karma yoga is where we do an activity, but we may not be attached to the fruits of that activity. Everybody must engage in some sort of activity in this material world, but actions can either bind one to this world or liberate one from it. So we've gone through that. And we'll talk more about Karma Yoga. Um, where, well, we can actually. Karma Yoga is basically where we do our duty without attachment to the fruits. So Arjuna was encouraged, fight for the sake of fighting. Uh, and don't think about whether you're going to win or lose. That's beside the point. Your activity should be to uphold the law, to punish the miscreants. And whether you succeed or not, that's not up to you. That is up to the divine. Even somebody, even someone may be liberated from this world through the practice of karma or bhakti yoga, still, whilst in this world, they will continue to act as an to set an example. So um, he says uh, that the devotees of the Lord, they will, um, even though they don't have to do any um, activities because they're already liberated, they will. They will act in order to set an example to others. Otherwise, we, we just be lazy. But the devotee can just chant and just focus on the Supreme Lord, meditate. He could just do that, but he won't. He will do much, he will do activities which will set an example for others how to live. He will also do his chanting and meditation, but he'll do other activities as well. Finally, Arjun also questions the Lord regarding what impels one to commit sinful acts. And Krishna emphatically answers him. He said, Arjun says, you know, you, sometimes we do things, even we don't want to do it, but we, it's like we are forced to do them. Why? So Arjun then, and Krishna answers him that, Kamesha, Krodesh, it's, be, it's because... You are driven by lust. Lust is the uh, all endowing enemy of the soul. So, if and what is lust? 
Lust isn't just some attraction between men and women. Lust is the attraction of having material possessions um, or material respect or material prestige, which we think are going to um, make us happy in this world. So we're lusting for temporary things which uh, we consider will enhance our enjoyment in this world. Uh, so that's why why we have this uh, uh, impetus to perform crazy activities to try to enjoy. That's the basic reason. So that's chapter three. I'm going to stop there. Any any questions? Any comments? Okay, let's stop there. Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Sanatana Dharma ki jai.